Yes, ma'am, we're recording. We 
are physiologically able to use proteins for energy. We just really don't do that very much, all right? And this will, this will give you an idea here. So protein metabolism is generally quite, quite low for humans. Um, if I am on a really extreme low calorie diet, then one of the things that the body will do, and I think I mentioned this the other day, is it will save itself as best it can, right? So if I'm not feeding it enough calories, I have stored calories, I have fat, I have muscle. So if that extreme dieting goes on for long enough and we've used up quite a lot of the stored fat, it will start breaking down muscle tissue in order to fuel your well-being, right? To keep you warm, to keep your heart going, to keep your lungs working. It'll do whatever it can to keep you alive for as long as it can, right? So one of the things we see in people that do extreme low calorie diets for a very long time is that they start to lose muscle mass, right? And from a health perspective, let alone a, a sport perspective, right? Obviously, the more muscle I have, then the more calories I burn, so the easier it is to keep my weight stable, right? The more muscle I have, the stronger I am, the more independent I can be within my lifestyle, right? There's, there's just multitude pluses to being strong and having muscle mass, right? So if I'm on a very high protein diet, so one of the arguments that, that these companies make when they're trying to sell you these high protein diets is that if your diet is really high in protein, your body adapts to use more protein for energy. Okay? That is technically true. Right? And this is part of the problem. These companies don't lie to you. They kind of fudge the truth a little bit, right? If you eat a high protein diet, if you eat a high fat diet, if you eat a high carbohydrate diet, your body will adapt to the food you are giving it and it will use that food more than normal for energy production. But since our use of protein is normally very, very, very small, the increase in using proteins for energy is not that much. Okay? And in order to have a high protein diet, you probably have not very many carbs, which means you are not giving your body the carbohydrate it needs to fuel anaerobic glycolysis and to fuel the beginning of aerobic metabolism. Right? So you're going to feel fatigued anyway. So, yes, we can use amino acids if we need to. Yes, if we exercise for a very long time, we start to utilize a little bit. Regardless of this picture, we've got to minimize muscle loss. Right? Go all the way back to, to a couple of weeks or so, a week and a half ago, when we looked at that study that said we saw the same weight loss for every group of individuals, but the group who only dieted and did not exercise, only 63% of that weight loss was actually fat mass. Right? And 97% of the weight loss was fat mass in the group that dieted and did aerobic work and did resistance work. Right? Because if I maintain muscle mass while I'm dieting, then what I'm losing is fat mass, hopefully, if I'm doing it right. 
Okay. So, just to show you what extreme dieting can look like. <laughs> um, sadly, and I caveat this came off of the internet, so it's possible it was airbrushed, but it's also possible it wasn't airbrushed because there are women walking down catwalks that look like this. But look at the lack of muscle that this individual has. that's what happens. Plus, you can guarantee that her bone density is really poor as well. Okay. All right. So Austin's going to be very happy today because we're going to start answering some of his questions from earlier in the week. Okay. So, um, which substrate do we use at what time? Okay. So, yes, which one we use depends on availability. So, if I eat a diet that is high in a particular one, I'm going to utilize that substrate more than typical, as I said. Okay. But, typically, if we exercise for less than an hour, then less than 2% of that energy came from protein. Right? If I exercise for three to five hours, so if I run a marathon, then anywhere from five to 15 is a bit high. Most, most resources would say 10 here. Our book is a little more generous, but still, Right? In five hours of exercise, 15% of the energy I needed for that exercise came from protein. That does not warrant protein as an energy source in my book. Right? That's a bit of a fib. It's just not a lie. Right? Remember that if we are working anaerobically, system one is going to utilize energy bonds that are already available in the muscle cell. So stored ATP and stored phosphocreatine. Once we transition into glyco glycolysis, then we are going to use carbohydrate, glucose. Right? We cannot use proteins or fats anaerobically. Okay, so people who want to lose weight, who go out and train really, really hard, are not going to lose fat mass. Right? That's not the way to do it. Okay? This glucose is either going to come directly from the bloodstream or it's going to come from the breakdown of glycogen. Right? Once we go for long enough that we start creating ATP predominantly aerobically, then we're going to use primarily carbs and triglycerides depending upon the intensity and the duration and or the duration of the exercise. So our first factor that we want to investigate is what happens around intensity, workload, how hard I'm working. Right? So when you're at rest, right now, about 33% of your ATP is coming from carbohydrate and about two-thirds of your energy is coming from fat sources, right? from stored fat in in the lipid cells or in the fat from in the muscle tissue. Okay. As your workload increases, then the percentage of ATP that comes from carbohydrate increases for several reasons. Right? Remember that carbs are a small molecule. They're, very, they're relatively easy to break apart to get at energy. Right? So, if my workload goes up, I need energy faster. Right? 
in relation to how much that workload goes up. So the faster my ATP is required, the quicker I need to be able to access it. Right? And I can access it most quickly from carbohydrate. Okay. Theoretically, because we don't really ever work at 100% intensity because we fall flat on our face. Right? So, but theoretically, if we were working at 100% intensity, 100% of, of our energy would be coming from carbohydrate. Right? If you remember that bar continuum chart that I showed you the other day, Remember, right down on this end, we said that at 100% there wasn't anything coming from aerobic metabolism. If there's nothing coming from aerobic metabolism, I can't be using fats. Okay. So, we start off here using predominantly fats. We stand up. Well, that's a big increase in intensity in and of itself, right? And then we start walking or walking quickly or running because we're late for the next class because doctor will talk too much, right? And we need ATP much more quickly so that we can move that fast and so we start using carbohydrate, right? Because carbohydrate gives us more energy for any oxygen use. Something we haven't talked about yet but we will come to is that the harder we work, the more fast twitch muscle fibers, type 2 muscle fibers we use to generate the force to do that work. And type 2 muscle fibers are much better at using carbohydrate than they are at using fats. When we start to move, we start to release stress hormones, right? and epinephrine stimulates the enzymes in the glycolytic chain, which make breaking down carbohydrate easier. Right? And remember our pyruvate at the bottom of glycolysis? if we're working anaerobically, is going to pick up a hydrogen and turn into lactate. Those increases in blood lactate levels inhibit lipase that breaks down triglyceride, or facilitates breaking down triglyceride. So the more lactate I am producing, the less fat metabolism is occurring. really clever. It's really clever. It doesn't rely on one mechanism for something to happen. There's a whole like domino effect going on. So, okay, here we go. When we are looking at intensity and the relationship between intensity and fats and carbohydrates then, on this particular graph they use percentage VO2 max. Remember yesterday we talked about we can use percentage heart rate max, we can use percentage VO2 max as a measure of intensity. All right? So on this particular graph they're using VO2 max. And here is percentage energy from carbs and triglycerides. So, down here I'm not working very hard. Right? Low intensity. So at low intensity, I'm using the orange is triglyceride and the blue is carbohydrate. So I'm using about 70%, or we said like 66, two thirds. So around 65 to 70% of my, of my energy at low intensity is coming from triglyceride, and the other third is coming from carbohydrate. The harder I work, 
the faster I need access to ATP, the more carbohydrate I have to start using to produce ATP. Okay? This here is called the crossover, and the crossover occurs at around 35%. VO2 max, which means it's probably around 50%, I don't know off the top of my head, but somewhere around 50% heart rate max. Does that make sense? All right. So taking this, I want to do this now. Yes. Taking this idea, another concept that we have is then where, how hard do I want to work to maximize stored fat use? Okay. And so another very useful visual tool. This is fat metabolism. And this is intensity. What the research shows us is that the relationship here looks a little bit like this. And so, what we're looking at is optimal fat use is occurring in this zone. Does everybody agree with that? Right? That's what the graph is telling us, yes? Okay. So, then, if I have someone who wants to lose fat mass, I want them to work in this zone, right? So this zone is if I'm looking at percentage heart rate max, it's going to be 68 to 79 percent heart rate max. If you want it as percentage VO2 max, it's about 55 to 72 percent VO2 max. So this is a pretty crucial idea, right? Because very often, um, even if I'm an athlete, right, I can't stay super lean all year. That's not healthy. All right? So an athlete should be cycling between periods of time where there aren't really big important competitions, where they're a few pounds heavier, and then periods of time where they are training into a big competition where they want to be lean, right? But you can't stay that lean all year. It just isn't healthy. Plus, it's not manageable, right? <laughs> because no one wants to live like that all the time. You can manage it for like three months to get ready for world championships, and then you're like, sod this. I'm going to eat as much ice cream as I want, right? So, you, you, athletes, as well as regular people, are going to have to cycle, so this can help them as well, okay? So, it doesn't matter who we're working with, it's likely that this idea of the intensity level 
is going to be useful to help them out. And remember the chart yesterday where we had very low, low, moderate, high, very high intensity, right? Look at this level. We said that moderate intensity ran from 60 to 90 percent heart rate max ish, I think. 85, something like that. Look where we are. We are not working at high intensity if we want to burn fat. Not that we don't burn, right? We still burn fat at higher intensities, okay? But we, we use the most amount of fat working at a moderate intensity level.
a useful tool as well, because that means if my goal is to use as much fat mass as I can, I want to make sure that I haven't had any carbohydrate within the previous 30 to 60 minutes before the exercise session. That brings its own baggage because for some people not having carbohydrates just before they train means that they have a blood glucose dip in the middle of training and they can't maintain intent. Right? That's a whole other picture. We're talking just about fat loss right now. Okay. So that means that we don't want to use a carbohydrate drink or have a snack of carbohydrate just before training if the goal is fat loss. If the goal is muscle mass, we're talking that's a whole different picture. Right? If the goal is fat loss, we don't want a lot of carbohydrate in the system driving an insulin surge that decreases the action of lipase on triglycerides. Right? So again, the goal setting thing is really, really, really important. And remember, the only person who can set goals is you. Right? Because goals from anybody else don't mean anything. Okay? Doesn't matter if coach says, oh, the goal is to win the game. And you're standing there going, no, the goal is to get through the game without breaking my leg. That's my goal. You can have your own damn goal. You go out there and play. Right? Unless your goal is to win, his goal is irrelevant. Okay? So goal setting and knowing what your clients, students, athletes, whoever's personal goals are is important because it dramatically changes nutrition and training strategies. Okay. I'm going to come back to that last point in a minute. I want to go back to the other diagram and flip it around. So this time we're looking at this graph and instead of intensity, we have duration. And this time, the blue is the triglycerides, and the orange is the carbs. So this time, what the graph tells us is that when I work for a short amount of time, my predominant substrate is carbohydrate. Okay. Now bear in mind that if I'm working for a short amount of time, I'm probably working harder. Okay. If I'm working harder, I have to access carbohydrate to produce ATP quickly enough. So it's really saying the same thing as the other graph, it's just using a different variable. Right? The longer I work, the less I need carbs because the more I make, the more time I have to access energy stored in triglycerides. This time, my crossover is around 20 minutes or so for most people. Give or take individual differences, and give or take training level of the athlete in a particular event. All right? If I'm a highly trained endurance athlete, this is going to be a little bit earlier than 20 minutes. 
because that's part of the training. Get out the energy sooner. So what does this tell me then? This means that my three times ten minutes might make me a little bit more healthy, but it doesn't give me the opportunity to lose fat mass. All right. So that three times ten minutes is impacting the cardiovascular system, which is super important in long-term health, but it isn't going to help me lose weight. And again, that's another misunderstanding that people have. Because they hear that, oh, I only have to move for 10 minutes and that makes me more healthy. And healthy becomes lose weight. And it's not the same thing. Okay? So would you say healthy maintains weight and keeps you healthy? Or what would you say that three ten, by ten minutes? The, the three by ten minutes. Um, well, the only thing that's going to help you maintain weight is balancing your energy scale, right? Um, the three by ten minutes improves cardiovascular and blood flow um, and the health of the inside of the arteries. Not by a lot, but by enough. And the, the goal, uh, my personal opinion, because obviously I'm not involved in the, at the level where people are sending out this information, my personal opinion is that by breaking it down into three lots of ten minutes, you make it doable. And that improves motivation, and that improves compliance. And then, after three, four weeks of doing three lots of ten minutes, you suddenly find yourself walking for, oh, it's 14 minutes, I didn't even know. And then, over time, maybe you get to the 30 minutes. That's what I think. You know, yes, there is research that shows 10 minutes impacts CB health, but I think it's to do with motivation and compliance to a program. Because that's the hardest thing, is getting people to stick at it. It's impossible. So, now we've got crossover occurring at 20 minutes. So, I can't exercise for 20 minutes and stop. Because at 20 minutes, that's the time I start using fat. Right? So that means that if my goal is fat loss, I need to become fit enough to work at this intensity for more than 20 minutes. You may not have, you may not be working with people who are fit enough to work at that level for more than 20 minutes. So then, you have to explain, I understand that this is your goal, I really do. But you have to understand that you are not fit enough to train hard enough, long enough to achieve that goal yet. So, the pre-phase for the goal is going to be getting you in shape so that you can work at this level for 30 minutes. Because if you don't explain it, and they don't see the effect they're expecting by paying you, you don't get paid. They don't achieve your goal. You didn't do your job. Right? Does that make sense? So, there's a lot of factors. There are a lot of pieces to the pie. The idea is making sure that I got them all. I understand all these concepts and I know when I can and cannot put them all together. Right? Because it's a complicated picture. Again, it's very easy to say losing weight, being fat, being obese is all about this energy scale. But it's 
bigger than that. It's more complicated than that because once the weight is there, the ability to move goes down. Right? So ideally what we want is to intervene with your age, with younger, make sure that you enjoy moving and that we don't have a situation where you're not able to manage this workload. And then what do the universities do? And the school systems do? Cut recess, cut PD, cut HPE 142 that was our last ditch attempt to get you guys interested in being healthy. Cut activity classes. You don't have to have, when I came here, you had to have activity classes on your degree plan in order to graduate. Now you don't. So where in the policy that is going on are we doing what needs to be done to tackle the problem? I don't get to vote, I'm not a citizen. You guys have to go out there and change the policy because the picture that we see is going to get worse because we are doing the exact thing we need not to do to put it right. So we ain't putting it right, we're making it worse. And it's going to keep getting worse until you guys go and change it. And on that I will get off my soapbox. Wish you all a very happy weekend and I'll see you on Monday.